Have you ever had the courage to speak up? Well, our next guest not only had the courage to speak up, but she found herself in the midst of a national controversy. So you don't want to miss her story. And we're going to be talking about that next. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. In 2017, then 22-year-old graduate student Lindsay Shepard was called into a disciplinary meeting with two professors and a education bureaucrat. She was called in to talk about a class that she was tutoring in, and the rest is history. From there, there was quite a discussion around a number of issues, and you'd be shocked about that story. And with me here to talk about that story is the author and columnist, Lindsay Shepard. Welcome, Lindsay. Thanks for having me today. Well, Lindsay, it is very uh, exciting to talk with you today because um, I think for many people, um, your story was a kind of a landmark story, a revelation, if you will, about what's going on in Canada's universities. And it's a story that I think I'd like to walk through with you today, if I can, because I think there's some much larger lessons to be learned about it. So you entered the program in a master's in communications, but a particular type of study of communication. So I just want to set the, the stage here a little bit. So part of that communications program is that you would lead a, a class in discussions and particular topics about grammar. Is that right? Right. So the professor would take care of the main lecture, which is in the lecture hall. But because there are hundreds of students, you know, you also need to have that um, closer, you know, smaller classroom time. So that's where, you know, the teaching assistants come in. Now, I understand, Lindsay, that one of the topics related to grammar was the whole debate, if you will, regarding the use of pronouns. Can you tell us more about that debate and, and the context uh, way back in 2017? Yeah, so we had a textbook assigned to the course, very typical, and it did have a, a section on pronouns, which I found kind of intriguing because at the time that was a major topic in the news. Um, and, and just in society, people talking about pronouns. Um, and so my angle with the class, I thought, okay, let's bring in this really kind of bigger picture topic and bring it back down to the grammar level. So talking about um, he, she, they. So can they be used to refer to someone in the singular? Um, what, what other languages do we know that use non-gendered pronouns versus gendered pronouns? So it was an academic discussion and um, it was, you know, derived from the textbook. The, the class was very engaged in the discussion. And, you know, to demonstrate, I should mention the whole thing. Uh, I, I brought in a clip from TV Ontario, so publicly funded television, a show called The Agenda with Steve Pakin. Uh, I had watched clips from that in my, you know, undergraduate career before great show that covers a lot of different things. So on one mm -hmm. panel discussion, they were featuring Dr. Jordan Peterson, who was then, you know, uh, burgeoning, he was becoming more and more famous, um, you know, psychologist at the University of Toronto. And he was talking about Bill C-16. So adding pronouns on the basis of grounds that you can't, you know, like gender expression, adding gender expression to the basis of grounds that you cannot discriminate against. So he was talking about how people's preferred pronouns will become uh, compelled speech. And if you don't use them, you could end up, you know, in a criminal situation. So I brought this in, in the discussion about pronouns. And, you know, this, I mean, this whole, this whole section about talking about pronouns, it's probably lasted 12 minutes. So it was not even the majority of the classroom time that I had. Um, mm -hmm. The class went well. Like I said, people were engaged. Um, you know, usually you get a lot of students who are disengaged. They're on their laptops, they're on their phones. I'm sure it's even more like that now after years of online learning, but even back then it was like that. And, um, but this 
particular class, you know, everyone was um, listening to each other speak, listening to each other's um, points of view. And uh, it, it was a great class or so I thought. And, and just to clarify for, for people that maybe are not as familiar with this, there's this movement where people are putting in beneath their signature, like on their email, they're saying um, he, him, or like, can you explain that to us? Like how that's coming into culture today and people's emails and what, why are they doing that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's exploded since then. I mean, even five years ago that was starting. Um, so yeah, people will put he, him, she, her, people also use kind of like double pronouns. So I've seen she, they, or he, they, so like, you know, kind of a refer to me how you want kind of thing. Or they're like, I'm any, any gender. Uh, so that's, you know, they're just identifying, they're trying to show solidarity with maybe people who use alternative pronouns. I should mention this, this kind of isn't so much a debate in, in 2023, but back in 2017, people were talking about G, Zer, Z, Zer, Zim, like these very alternative pronouns. That, that, that almost sounds like a different language. You mean these are kind of modifiers of how people want to be referred to as, is that right? That's right. Yeah. And I think five years ago, it was it was more of a debate. It turns out not that many people, I, I think it'd be pretty rare to meet someone who actually goes by Xi Uh But the, the they, them for a single person has become, I would say, you can definitely run into someone who has that. Uh, these days, I mean, even employees of businesses, Starbucks, for example, they give their employees little pins that say she, her. Um, oh, so yes, yeah, right. the, yeah. So it, it's just kind of everywhere. Uh, it's become yeah. an orthodoxy, right? Dr. Jordan Peterson, what is his concern basically in this context, in the clip that you showed? Um, there's clearly people that would advocate for the use of these kind of different variation of pronouns out of a kind of a tolerance or a concern for other people. But what is Dr. Peterson's point, if, if I understand that correctly? Yeah, his point was that it was going to become compelled speech. And um, he's, he has spoken about how something like your personal pronoun is not a one-way street. It's not all about how you see yourself. It's also about how other people see you. And so, yeah, if you were to misgender someone, call someone by the wrong gender, mm. um, you could be committing a crime or, or like a hate crime or hate speech something along those lines. And then he was debating with another professor who was Nicholas Matt, a professor of transgender studies at the U of T. And Matt's argument was, well, we just have to use these pronouns because this is people's dignity. And so I, mm -hmm. I very specifically showed both sides of that argument um, because that's what I saw my job as, as, as a, someone who was teaching at the front of the classroom, is you show multiple perspectives, you show both sides. And I remained neutral in this discussion because that's how okay. I saw my job. Well, so you remained neutral, you showed the clip, and then you thought you had a very good class. And then you got a call. Is that right? Or an email? I got an email. I got an email that said there were some concerns about my class. So the email didn't say anything about what the concerns were. They were just concerns. I had to meet with the professor of the class as well as a diversity office um, manager and the coordinator of my graduate studies program. Now, all this was strange because what does the coordinator of my graduate program have to do with this? It's a different department. Like, you know, is my status as a graduate student at risk here? That was one red flag. Other, you know, red flag was I'm not, I didn't feel I was someone who needed to meet with a diversity bureaucrat. Uh, so I thought, really? Like me? Okay, well, I'll go to this meeting and I'll record it because there were just too many red flags. And I just, I just thought I need to be able to protect myself because this is just very strange. I've never been in a situation like this. So you decided your spidey sense, your spidey senses were, were tuned up and you said, wow, I should record this. Um, that's kind of amazing. Have you... That's not necessarily a usual thing to do in a meeting, but you had the sense that I should record it. Yeah, no, I I didn't even have a precedent for that. Like I'd never heard of anyone recording a meeting. I just kind of knew, I mean, a lot of people have pointed out like 
we were not in a union. I didn't have any representative. I didn't have any witness who would obviously be on my side. It was just me in there. And so I felt I need some way to back myself up. So what? how did that conversation go? What? What's the basic outline of it? The basic outline was um, I had remained neutral when I brought Jordan Peterson into the classroom. And Jordan Peterson is basically like Hitler. Uh, that's what one of my professors said. And so I was Sorry, accused. They, they compared Dr. Jordan Peterson uh, to Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Um, why, uh, why would they say that? Because he's evil to them, right? He's he's not part of their their leftist orthodoxy, so he he must be super evil. Uh, they called him a whole bunch of other things too, you know, a charlatan. Even though, oh. as an academic, he is more accomplished than either of the two professors in the room. They said a whole bunch of things, um, but I was accused of transphobia, um, targeting trans students. And oh. I violated the school's sexual and gendered harassment policy by not respecting preferred pronouns and exposing people to transphobia. And uh, I had also broken the Ontario Human Rights Code and Bill C-16 itself. Wow. So they were saying many, many things, including that you were out of line and um, we, it was a difficult conversation. And, and so I, we do have that um, uh, a part of the clip of that recording and we'd like to play that now if we could. Do you understand how what happened was contrary to, sorry, what was the, the, the policy? The, the, the gender, and gender and sexual violence policy. Like, do you understand how- But sorry, what did I violate in that policy? Um, so, gender-based violence, uh, transphobia. Uh, do you see where, like, how this is not, this is not something, like, that's intellectually neutral, that is kind of up for debate? This, I mean, this is the Charter of Rights and But freedoms. it is up for debate. But, I mean, you're perfectly welcome to your own opinions, mm -hmm. but when you're bringing it into the context of the classroom, that can become problematic. But when they leave the university, they're going to be exposed to these ideas. So I don't see how I'm doing a disservice to the class by exposing them to ideas that are really out there. And I'm sorry I'm crying. I'm stressed out because this to me is so wrong. It's so wrong. Well, it, it's it's an astounding conversation. Um, you can actually go online and, and listen to the whole conversation. It's, it's really an eye-opening uh, conversation. Uh, that's the understatement of the day. But you you took that recording and um, you decided to share it with the media. Can you tell us what happened then? Yeah, so after I left the room, right after, I was pretty upset. Uh, to me, you know, I kind of only had an instinctual understanding of what university was, what the university stood for. Mm -hmm. I, I hadn't studied it in the way that I have now, you know, like really looking at the foundation of of the purpose of a university. That's just something I hadn't looked into. I just kind of thought instinctually they're violating what academia is all about. And I think I'm in the right here. So immediately after the meeting, I thought, well, at this point, well, you know, something also from the meeting is that they were insinuating that I might be kicked out. Or something because they said they need to bring this issue to the chair of the department they need to see what the next steps here are um wow. that was the very end of the meeting and so i thought okay well it looks like at this point i have nothing to lose because um i'm i might be kicked out anyway so let's show people what's going on here and so i wow. looked up local reporters who have written about freedom of expression or academic freedom in the past I thought, okay, who will have an understanding of this? And one of the people I reached out to was Christy Blatchford from the National Post. She has now passed away, unfortunately, very sadly. Mm -hmm. But she was the first one who kind of immediately replied. And that was the first story on November 10th, 2017. Yeah. And I, I personally remember that well, uh, Lindsay. Um, and it just went viral, didn't it? Um, why do you think it went viral? 
this story? I think at that point, people still cared about universities. I think now there's been a lot of demoralization over the years. But I think things were different back then because people still felt invested in universities as places that, you know, their children or grandchildren will go and improve their future and deepen their knowledge. Uh, and so they they saw this direct evidence. I think maybe because I recorded the meeting, this was the first time people had direct evidence that the university is not how they remember it or it's not the I- idyllic thing it, it used to be. It's not a mm-hmm. place in society. Uh, and yeah. now we have direct proof. And interestingly, you know, the mainstream media was actually very fair to me. And oh, really? I, mm-hmm. I felt they were. And I've had other people say the same thing. It was really just the, the professors, specifically at Laurier, but also just leftist professors at any university who were the ones who were being very hostile, very vicious. Wow. But in terms of how I was portrayed in the media, I didn't have any major complaints, I would say. Well, that's point. great. But to be clear, um, it went viral because you had blown the whistle on the state of what's really going on. Um, we, you know, we have to be careful. We can't generalize across every university, but most public universities are kind of like this. They're they're dominated by radical leftist, um, ac- you know, academics, particularly in the humanities, who are all about this kind of perspective and don't want there to be, um, dare I say, a kind of a freedom of speech. Is that right? That's right. They don't want to be challenged. And a part of me thinks it's because they actually aren't familiar with the opposing arguments. They actually can't defend a lot of their their very staunchly held beliefs. Um and so, yeah, they, they are not for freedom of expression. They're not for independent thought. And there was a tweet I saw by an artist named Nina Paley the other day. She said, universities are a welfare system for PhD students, something along the lines of that. Like, that's what they are now. So the point is that a lot of people in their minds, I assume that universities are places of learning and critical thinking and there's vigorous debate and healthy debate going on that are respectful but that's not what was going on here and and i think that's why your case your story is so powerful is that is that a fair comment lindsay it is yeah and from that point on everything kind of unraveled for me in terms of um how i thought about academia because before i had a lot of Mm. reverence for the university i thought this is just the the best institution we have. And um, I believe in everything it stands for. But yeah, at that point, I I started to see through a lot of what was going on. Um, You know, my my graduate program itself was very uh, academically and intellectually empty. Um, And I I mean, I still graduated with the degree because what can you do? But uh, a lot started to make sense to me, I would say after that, because I had a lot of analysts who had been following campus free speech issues for years, um, helping me see what was going on. Okay, so in that context, though, Lindsay, when when you say the degree was kind of intellectually empty, what do you mean by that? I, I think people would be shocked to hear that. Like, you went to graduate school, you did a master's in, in this particular area of communications. What do you mean that it was intellectually empty? Yeah, so this was the MA of Cultural Analysis and Social Theory. Like I said, I thought it sounded very philosophical, you know, with a hint of sociology in there. Um, It turns out it was just, it was the study of Michel Foucault, who's like the most cited scholar in in the social sciences. It's just nothingness. There's, it's really just nothingness. Um, I, I learned later that the program was on the chopping block a few years ago. I think my graduate program only had, you know, 12 people in it or something like that. Mm-hmm. And really the only value I got from the entire program was when I wrote my own master's paper at the end to graduate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wrote about, you know, I had an advisor who approached me and said, you should write about everything that's going on with these campus free speech issues. Uh, and so I did that. And yeah, that advanced me because it was my own project. It was my own 
paper, but the classes taught by the leftist professors were, yeah, just, just emptiness, really. Wow. So it, it, it must be confusing for people to hear this in the sense that the this particular university is dominated in the humanities by these people that are of a particular ideological point of view. They're they're how would you describe them? What what would you say is their ideology then? Is there is there a way to generalize? Oh yeah. Um so you know they're very pro trans women or women, so that kind of thing. Um they're pro land acknowledgement, so believing that uh everyone who's not an indigenous Canadian is an uninvited guest or settler. Mm -hmm. They you know, all of the universities issued statements about the 215 remains from the former Kamloops residential school where there's been no excavation. So there are no remains, but, um, you know, they'll, they'll go along saying that there are, um, you know, they're, they're, they use the pronouns. It's all about diversity, equity, inclusion. But what that really means is if you don't believe the same things we believe, then we will exile you. Uh, that's why I, I titled my book, Diversity and Exclusion, Confronting the Campus Free Speech Crisis. I wrote that in 2021 because, yeah, they don't want to include you. If you don't believe what they believe, they will exclude you. They will try to banish you. <laughs> so um, they're pro-choice, which, you know, pro-life, pro-choice, okay. But, uh, you know, they, I mean, these are people who will really shut down anything they don't believe. That's the whole mm -hmm. modus operandi here, right? If if they don't believe it, they will, they want to shut it down. Hmm. So it, it, people probably are, are again, surprised to learn that instead of being about tolerance, there is no room for other points of view. It's, it's actually very intolerant. Right. And it's become more insular at the universities now because, um, so the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship, they actually keep a whole database, like a case archive of examples of universities hiring, not by merit, you know, for professor positions, not by merit, but by skin color, gender, disability status, and oftentimes by ideology. You know, your research has to have certain conclusions. Um, a lot of the time this takes the plate, takes the form of decolonial methodology, like your whole research has to be about decolonizing. Uh, or you when you apply for a professor position, you have to show your show evidence that you have a commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. Of course, this would completely exclude someone like me from ever being near a university, right? Because I rip into their entire ideology. <laughs> so wow. um, yeah. So ironically, there's not a place for you in a university, among others, who are critical of this diversity, inclusion, equity agenda, this kind of ideology. Uh, is that right? Right. And, you know, they don't want to be attacked for, for something like that, even though mm -hmm. they deserve criticism. I mean, I'm sure we'll get into the lawsuit later, but uh, they said that if I'm not able to pursue an academic career, that's not their fault, but it's because I've been criticizing universities. Wow. Um, yeah, I think I'm allowed to criticize universities, as are you. Uh, there's a lot going on we need to talk about. They're, they're not immune to criticism. Yeah. Exactly. You, you think that that kind of uh, debate would be welcomed and necessary, especially when the taxpayer is funding a lot of the cost of these public universities. It almost begs the question, should we be defunding these public universities because they're not necessarily educating people, but only indoctrinating people in a particular ideology. Is that a fair comment? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think a, a lot of people have said, you know, if a, a university is not showing a commitment to free expression and um, academic freedom, then they should be defunded because that's right. They get billions of dollars of taxpayer funding um, every year, you know, Canada's universities. And what th these are just ideological training centers. That's what we want to spend billions of dollars on. So if when you step back, this is about five years now from this story. Are there lessons that you would say, well, these are these are important things that I've learned coming out of this? 
Yeah. I mean, like I touched on before, just kind of the whole respect I had for academia kind of came crumbling. Uh, I'm now a firm believer that we need to defund all of the diversity, equity, inclusion departments. There's no reason for those you would, to You would exist. defund them. Why is that? Oh, absolutely. They need to be shut down. They are in the business of, of um, shutting down speech they don't like. That's kind of all they do. And, and then they get people in trouble like me who are have, trying to have open discussions about current societal issues. One of, that, one of those issues happened to be pronouns. They want to shut that down. So they are, they are censors. Um, wow. That's kind of how they justify their whole existence. Uh, okay. Or they have you know, their trainings that they do. Laurier just implemented a, a new anti-racism training for all staff, all faculty. Uh, well, what is the training? It's just going to tell you, okay, you're allowed to say this. You're not allowed to touch this. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be imposing mm. these limits on people, making them self-censor, making them realize like, oh, okay, I, I can't touch that issue. Okay. Like that's what mm -hmm. it is. Um, but I think the universities, they're churning out all these people who are in, I mean, they have an MA social justice, um, MA women and gender studies, right? I mean, what else are these people going to do but work in diversity departments? And the heads of these departments get six-figure salaries. Um, wow. So, I mean, these just, it's so clear, it just needs to go. But unfortunately, we're just seeing it expanded to private businesses, other institutions. Well, well said, Lindsay Shepard, and thank you so much for sharing your powerful story, uh, a story of courage about how you spoke up. And thank you for joining us today and sharing insights about what we can all do to make Canada a better place of the strong and the free. Thank you. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.